Have you ever wondered what it's like to hand fly a rocket into space? Well, Virgin Galactic was nice enough to give Doss and I a tour of their awesome spacecraft simulator, and I got to sit in the pilot seat. It was a truly eye-opening and amazing experience. There's under a dozen people in the world trained to fly Spaceship 2, and now, with that particular vehicle's final flight behind us, that number likely won't change much, at least not until Virgin Galactic's Delta-class spacecraft come online in 2026. Let's take a look at how these elite pilots train to hand-fly a rocket into space. Of course, that training starts with a simulator, but it's not just any old Microsoft flight simulator. It's a truly amazing piece of technology. Here we go. So I'm going to go there again to get rid of that. And now, now we are in a good position and go. Ten seconds. Okay, so uh, are you running? Yes, we are running. Five seconds to go. Okay, I don't see the clock Three, moving. Two, one, release. Okay, it did. Okay, fire. So. We ignite the rocket motor and off we go. So now you've got to imagine you've got a 3G push in the back. <laughs> and there we are, we're supersonic, so I'm pitching it up into the vertical. Wow. And we're we're now doing Mach 1.3. And now I'm going to capture that vertical profile. Yes. When the solid motor ignited, it really felt real, and the thing we were sitting in wasn't moving at all, but the big screen and just everything going on at once really made things feel like I was there. After a brief few moments of level flight under power from the rocket engine, we then did the alpha turn, which is I believe what it's called, I could be wrong, but that's where the vehicle pitches up and goes nearly vertical all the way into space. And let me tell you, it was fun. So we're going straight up at this we're, point? We're close to straight up. We're not quite straight up, but we're getting very close. There's Mach 2, and now we're essentially straight up. So out the window, you see the sky go from blue to dark blue to black. Um, but we're still bathed in very, very bright sunlight. So you're looking at a black sky with a very bright sunlight outside. 110,000 feet? 110,000 feet, and we're coming up on Mach 3, three times the speed of sound. There's Mach 3. 130,000? And there's shut down. Okay. And at wow. this point, it's beautifully stable. I say, welcome to weightlessness. You're clear to unstrap. So as a customer, you can get out of your seat and float around in the cabin. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> and so you have uh, no noise, no force, and I'm going to raise the feather a moment, but once we get into the uh, inverted position, which I'm going to target uh, soon, then once we're in that inverted position, we think this is the, the best view, so we pitch over gently into the inverted position, and I stop it there with the reaction control system. All right, let's take a look now at the feathering of the wing. It's a variable geometry wing that changes shape between launch and entry, so the vehicle can safely and passively re-enter the atmosphere without the need for like a whole bunch of reaction control thrusters or a parachute or what have you. Whoa. So that's a kind of noise you can hear right now, that... Like RCS. Crash. That's RCS, exactly, reaction control system, which is just compressed air. I'm gonna get it there, and so now, the ship will stay there, it basically feels like it's motionless, it's not quite motionless, but it feels like it's motionless. And there's no force, there's no sound, and it's an amazing experience. So you look outside, and this, the view in the simulator is good, but in reality, the Earth's surface is much, much brighter, surprisingly bright. And that's because now we're looking straight down through the densest part of the atmosphere where all the moisture and dust particles are. So the Earth's surface looks incredibly bright. And by contrast, space looks incredibly black. It's like a dense matte black. But the human eye is amazing. It can pick up that range of brightness in the way that uh, a camera doesn't. And at the same time, you, you look at the atmosphere. The atmosphere looks worryingly thin. It's by the same relative thickness as an apple skin. Very, very thin, uh, but beautiful and multi-layered. And it's this kind of cyan blue color. The point at which we were upside down looking back at the Earth was really amazing, and I already know I want to go to space, but that moment I knew that I 
had to go to space. Hopefully someday in my lifetime it'll be possible, but either way, this simulation went a long way to helping me feel like I could understand what it's like to do something like fly on Unity or on another vehicle like, say, Dragon, Starship, Starliner, or what have you. So the human eye is wonderful, it picks up all of that. And at the same time, you can see so much of the curvature of the Earth, you get a sense of its scale, and you appreciate it's not very big. And you look out into the blackness of space, you can't see anything else. Wow. And that gives you an appreciation of how far away we are from anywhere else in the solar system, let alone the universe. So it's, uh, it's a very, very impactful experience. So we're still in weightlessness, that's Elephant Butte Lake down there. We're pitching it over now into the upright position in preparation for re-entry. And uh, shortly we'll be calling you to get back in your seats. You have been glued to the windows, uh, admiring this incredible view for around three minutes now. There's still weightlessness, but now we're back in the upright position. And this will give us a nice smooth re-entry as we start to come back down. If you look out sideways, you can just see the earth coming up to meet us. So at this point you're getting back in your seat, so still oh, yeah. zero G, but it's going to click over soon. The sensation of falling at this point is definitely you very that, dramatic. Um, yeah, oh, yeah, yeah, you can feel that, can't you, yeah. And so re-entry is interesting, it's one of the most interesting parts of it, because it's it, now it's silent, but you're going to start to hear the air molecules, the thin air molecules start to hit the underside, hit the underside of the vehicle, and then it builds very quickly to a crescendo. And it's louder than boost. It's like a waterfall hitting the underside wow. of uh, of the vehicle. It's very impressive, and it gives you that feeling that hey, you've been somewhere special, and now you're returning to Earth. So you'll see the the rates of descent there. Look, 120,000 feet per minute. Look at look at the way the so we're supersonic. We've been supersonic coming back down to reentry, around about 80,000 feet, which we're approaching rapidly. It becomes subsonic again. 85, 84, 83, 82, 81, 80. There you go, there's 80, and there's we're subsonic. So as it does that, there's a change in the aerodynamic center of the vehicle, and the nose pitches up a little bit. And, uh, but we're, I don't know if you can see, that's the airfield there. So yep. we're actually 10 miles away from the airfield. So we're in great shape. Uh, I can push and pull on the stick and nothing happens, but I can make it go, I can point it because the tails are up here at 60 degrees by applying a lateral force. Oh, because we're still feathered. You, yeah, because we're feathered. That gives you a lateral uh, control. So I can point it towards where we want to be. And that's that's a great position where we are right now. So is that 80,000 foot mark about where you would start using YIC input rather, uh, rather than RCS? Well, no, or? we can use it harder than that if you want to. Okay. Uh, but um, we just need some airflow around the surfaces to make it do that. So at 53,000 feet, I selected feather down. So, uh, and there's the feather coming down. And nothing much happens initially, and then those last few degrees of motion, the nose will pitch down quite dramatically. There oh, yeah. we go. Yeah. Wow. And then we lock the feather. <laughs> and there's space force there, see? Now's the part where we pitch back over for re-entry, and we basically did a nosedive, so our view went from horizon to looking straight down at the ground as we barreled towards it, which was, I mean, you can see the look on my face. It really gave me a distinct sense of falling. I, I, I don't know how to convey that to you in words, but it's remarkable the fidelity that this simulator provides. So we're at 42,000 feet, almost in the overhead of Spaceport. So wow. we've got lots of uh, energy um, to, to play with, and, uh, and but we're a glider now. So, um, you know, we need to monitor our energy pretty carefully. And we've got lots of ways, lots of independent, different ways of uh, monitoring energy, assessing it where we are from the displays here, uh, several different indications on this display and our energy display here, and also just looking out the window. So the, you know, you haven't seen all of it because I had to mask it, but uh, the, the avionics is actually pretty sophisticated and, and um, we're very, very pleased with it because we designed it in-house and uh, it, it you may have noticed that things change automatically. Yeah. This changes automatically as well to give you the display that you is most valuable to you at any one time. So it's a, it's a great system. But the FAA said as well, this is great, but what happens if uh, it all fails? And the argument against that is, well, the electrical architecture of the aircraft is such that you're never going to lose everything. But 
nevertheless we had to demonstrate. So I've flown this back in the simulator with a completely dark cockpit. And you can do that just by looking out the window. The, the, the aircraft actually handles really well. So I'm going to demonstrate how well it handles. We would never do this for real, uh, certainly with the customers, but uh, you can you know, do aerobatic type maneuvers in it it's quite quickly. Oh, wow. Uh, if you <laughs> and, then, and then it starts to yell at you. And, and it occasionally starts to yell at you, but it doesn't mean it. Yeah. Wow. So it's, uh, you know, it handles well. It's got a great field of view. The windows don't look very big, but with your head so close to them, uh, you get a great field. Oh, yeah. That's plenty. So, uh, yeah, it is. All right, this next part I did not expect. Chief Pilot Dave McKay, who was showing us the simulator, took us on a barrel roll as we were coming in for a landing. Of course, this is not something Virgin Galactic would ever do on a real flight, but is a fun and interesting way to showcase just how maneuverable Unity is. The barrel roll felt, I don't know, really fun. I've done barrel rolls in aircraft before, I've been lucky enough to be able to do that, uh, and yeah, the simulator was not much different, which is exactly how it should be, because you need to simulate, but y you get it. Yes. So I'm going to bring it back round to the left here. And uh, so for real, you know, with customers, we just do a gentle glide and um, we can do 360s or figures of eight or racetrack patterns just to bring it back in. This is, um, the sensation of movement is... It's quite convincing. It, it really, it? like, yeah, yeah it, it's yeah. remarkable. So, uh, so there's the airfield. And so the, the final approach is going to end up being an overhead 360 approximately. And so similar to the sort of thing that shuttle does, or did, I should say, and uh, that other uh, aircraft do as well. So this, you can see that circle there. Yeah. That's a, we call that the elephant's trunk because it flops around, but that's an instantaneous turn indication. Like if you maintain the current heading and turn rate, and that's where, that's where it'll end yeah. up. But more than that, you see when it changes from blue to white, Yep. with that, that dot there. That's where it, the system calculates we're going to be at the altitude of the next waypoint, which is the start of this final approach, which is 14,700 feet. Got it. So if I were to put the blue dot over the red cross, I should be there at the correct altitude, yeah? So that's, that's one indication we have. Also, this, the flight path vector here is giving me an indication of how well the aircraft is gliding, the spaceship is gliding right now, which is nominal. And then the red uh, horizontal line and the red vertical line, they are a kind of boresight to the next waypoint. Got it. Uh, and then on top of all of that, we also have this energy display here. So you see now we're 700 feet high. Typically pilots like to come in about 200 feet high or so. So if I'm a little bit too high as I am right now, I'm just going to have the speed breakout, which I got there, indicated there. And I'm just going to fly slightly wide and I'm slightly fast and that will get rid of the excess energy and you'll see it drop down there, yeah? Yep. And it, as it approaches the magenta line, it should go to on, it should, in, it should indicate that we are on energy. So I'm gonna run the speed brake in now and tighten the turn. I, I know we can't show, but this display is just, it's so cool. It is, yeah, it is. Uh, and that's why I say, you know, we're, we're quite proud of it because we, we built it in-house, designed it in-house. And um, it, is, it, is a, it is a great display. And so there's lots of ways of assessing your energy as well as seriously just simply looking out the window. And uh, so there you can see that we're, we're now on energy and we're in a good position. We're at the right speed. I'm at the right flight path angle. You turn to the and, next waypoint. And everything looks good. And of course it also tells me, you know, what the wind is. And so, you know, if there, if there was a, a wind, a headwind, I'd be um, changing what I'm doing slightly to cater for that wind. We joke about the stick or the yoke or the yick or whatever you want to call it, but it cannot be stressed enough that this is the only hand-flown spacecraft. And I know some of you out there are probably like, oh, it's suborbital, who cares? But still, if you're willing to strap yourself to a rocket and control it by your own hand, that's amazing. What is the situation with clouds? Like if there's, because yeah, it's almost can. always clear here, but sometimes yeah. you get a little cloud cover. Can so you just go through it? We can, we've got a, we've got a clearance. It, it's a glider, so unusual. We have got clearance from the FAA. In fact, the FAA suggested we did this, uh, but we can uh, penetrate cloud. Uh, we, in, in not to, we can, but we can penetrate cloud. And uh, so we've all got licenses or, uh, and qualifications, currency requirements are meant to do that. This turn is nuts. 
you think? Oh. It's just really beautiful seeing, just oh, seeing, beautiful. seeing white sands just over the mountain yeah, yeah. range. Yeah, yeah. So and you're the, on the front touch. So the next thing I need to do is lower the gear when I get to the right position. And I think that's good there. So I'm lowering the gear. And so there's the runway. It's 12,000 feet long. It's 200 feet wide. It's a great runway. So once I know I've definitely, I'm definitely going to make it, I'm going to get rid of the excess energy. So I'm going to do that by putting the speed brake out and accelerating. Wow, the runway comes at you fast. It does, yeah. So this part is pretty steep Four and thousand. fast. Yeah, very kind of unusually so. But what I'm doing now is bringing that touchdown point back towards the threshold. So I don't waste any valuable runway. So I do a two-stage flare here. Uh, at about uh, starting at about 300 feet and then I just hold it off and then just gently bring it down when the speed is right to touch down and once it touches which is there I'm going to hold the nose off hold the speed brake out we get some aerodynamic braking and I just keep it pointing down the middle of the runway and right about here 100 knots I'm going to derotate the nose and you hear this skid come into contact with a runway. It gives us a little bit of additional braking. It's remarkably shuttle-like. Yeah. And uh, around about here, I start uh, toe braking, braking on the main wheels. And my main aim now is to bring it to a halt on the center line for that all-important final landing photo. Nice. There you go. And I changed this display here because at this point it comes up because it always comes up with a system that is most important to us at any one time. At this point it will come up with a rocket display and we can, because what we want to do is make sure everything is safe for the ground crew to approach. So I can immediately look at that and see that all the balance are closed, etc. And then we go through the rest of the after landing checks. So that's it. Welcome back to Earth. And uh, this is where we, you know, we clean up, we debrief. We go and have uh, a party, and we have uh, astronaut wings and well earned. Yeah, I mean this is the only hand-flown spacecraft. Yeah. So it makes sense that you want to use the sim as much as you can and get as much practice yeah, we, as you we can. We use it a lot, uh, but it's uh, it's a great airplane. Flies it's a remarkable machine. Can I ask about the buttons? Yeah. So uh, it's these are complex. These are for the flight control system. So we have. Um, electrically actuated actuators that are moving the, the stabs and we have systems in there which are a little bit like auto stabilizers you know or uh, and so th those are those functions and then the rest of it is uh, trim switches and speed brake switches there and there's radio transmit switches yeah very cool yeah so so getting out is the reverse of getting in so grab the handles and just go up backwards and step down just a reminder it's a big step down okay and, uh, that was so cool. All right. All right, wasn't that awesome? Thanks again to Virgin Galactic for showing Doss and I around and being kind enough to let us ride inside a very important piece of equipment. That was awesome.